So my talk is called SDK Reference Manuals, a Flow-Based Approach. It's, strap yourselves in, it's gonna be riveting. <laughs> Go with the flow. Possibly a better title. Should have gone with that, but it was too late. So SDK Reference Manuals, a Flow-Based Approach. That's what we're going with because I want to talk about SDK reference manuals. So first, a definition, a software development kit, SDK, is software that you can use to make other software. Applications specifically is what you're gonna be making with an SDK. And uh, reference manuals for SDKs are not user guides or tutorials. Um, they detail the specific code entities, um, the classes, methods, functions, parameters, return values, things like that, that are in the SDK. Uh, they tend to be written in the actual code comments, in the code as comments, um, and then they're generated into a browsable site or a PDF um, by tools like Doxygen, Javadoc, and Typedoc, depending on, depending on the language you're using. Uh, they may contain code examples and diagrams, but they're not, again, they're not tutorials. They're not going to cover high level, high level concepts necessarily. Um, in this talk, I'll be going over the issues that I've observed with SDK reference manuals that I've, that I've made, the issues that I've uh, seen and the issues that I've done. Um, we're gonna talk about the flow-based approach to reference manuals and we're gonna be talking about the politics of being, uh, how, did that, how did that get in there? Um, <laughs> of, uh, of being a documentarian, you're an external team member maybe, and uh, you're going to be writing code comments. Uh, so, there's some, so there's some politics there. Um, you could also be a, 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 team, a developer on an SDK team and you wanna improve your docs. So th this talk is for you. And also, if you're here, just don't leave. This talk is for you. <laughs> so here's uh, just a... <laughs> this is a bit about me. My name is Chris. Uh, I'm a developer educator at MongoDB. Uh, since recently, uh, I'm Canadian, as was mentioned. So come and talk to me after if you're Canadian, too. We all get along. Secret handshake. Um, so I, my professional background is, is in uh, software development. Uh, I was previously a technical lead um, and working on an SDK. Uh, and, uh, but my educational background is in uh, arts, so I uh, have a BA in English. And so, uh, so my current role is kind of a fusion of the two. But overall, I'm, I'm pretty much new to the uh, doing documentation full time. Uh, or as a, as a full-time part of my job. And uh, although as an SDK developer, I probably should have spent more time doing it, but, um, but, uh, but yeah, so thank you for welcoming, welcoming me here. So let's talk a bit about developer docs. So one familiar experience that you can have when you're um, using a reference manual is you can see a lot of information and you can see a lot of words and links and just stuff, but you can, you'll just be asking yourself, scratching your head and saying, what is this for? You can say, what is this method? What can this method do for me? Um, and I think in general, um, my observation has been that developer docs tend to be implementer oriented, not user oriented. And by implementer, I mean the person writing the SDK, the person implementing the SDK is going to be also writing the docs um, and they're going to be writing it from their perspective, not the user's perspective. So some more, just, just to talk about, I'm just gonna go into uh, what my observations about developer docs. Um, they tend to be an afterthought. Um, devs see doing documentation as a chore um, and it's not something that they wanna do. They tend to not have examples, and uh, this hurts the overall experience because you, as a user, you kind of want to 
get, get your information quickly and you'd like to see the syntax um, and be able to copy and paste it. They're incomplete. They don't mention important facts or important details uh, that you may need to know. They're on an island. I'm going somewhere with this. Um, <laughs> I had, this one was a stretch, but they're on an island, meaning they're not linked to, um, they're not a part of the overall documentation experience that you have. They, they may not, they may just exist on a S3 bucket somewhere um, and not even be linked from your main, main site or just sort of hidden off in the corner. Um, and they're not even, uh, the pages in the SDK reference manual may not have any coherent links to the other pages in the SDK manual. So you, so they're on an island. That's, that's how I'm putting it. Just to fit into this forced uh, thing. They're useless. Is this true? They can be useless because if you're, if you're going to a reference manual, you want to find out what, like how to use it, and you're not finding what you're looking for if it's, if it's going to be, if it's not user-oriented. And they're yucky to look at sometimes. This is a minor point um, because SDK reference manuals, they're detailing specific code, uh, code entities. They're going to be, um, it's going to be function over form, and it's more important to have all the information available there and have it correct than looking nice. But just to take an example, uh, the sort of quintessential uh, developer design um, here is Javadoc. And all of the information is there, and it's, it's fine. But those are frames, uh, HTML. And it's just the colors are all over. There's gradients. It just looks dated. I don't know. And there's not enough space. But again, it's a minor point. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Just look at my slides. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Function over form. But again, you can download themes and plugins for your uh, Javadoc or TypeDoc generator. Um, and, uh, and that can give you some white space and a bit of organization there. So that's all I'll say about that, about Yucky to look at. So let's go with the flow. What's one approach that we can take to, to improve the experience? Uh, a flow-based approach is asking the question, what do users want to do with the SDK? And framing our information that way. So again, this is, we're not making a tutorial. This is a reference manual, so um, we want to think at a high level of what, uh, of what activities the users will want to do with the SDK. Um, and we're just using this as a way to organize the information that's in the SDK reference manual. We're not moving away from, from detailing specific code entities. So let's go into the process a bit. Uh, we have two major phases here. One is going to be on paper, and then, the, and then we're going to go into the code uh, and actually edit some code. Um, the first thing we'll want to do is identify our flows. Uh, this should be done for you anyway, because if you're making an SDK, if you're making a product, you're probably going to know what users are going to want to do with it. But let's identify them anyway. Then we're going to take all the entities, um, group them all by, the flow, by each flow that we have, and then order them in that flow. And that's just going to be on paper. So the first thing we'll do is identify flows. There's some color. And um, so MongoDB Stitch is the product that I work on at Mongo, and um, it is a backend as a service. Um, we used, um, we asked a question on our doc site um, to users saying, what are you trying to do with MongoDB Stitch? And we combined that with our common sense and our understanding of what the product is for um, to come up with two flows. The major things that they want to do, that users want to do, is log in and read and write data. Logging in includes switching users and logging out, but overall it's sort of authentication types of things. And then reading and writing data has to do with accessing the database. If we take another example, not too contrived, I hope, uh, we have libtreasure. Let's say we're going to write a, a SDK called libtreasure. It's a library for looting treasure, OK? So you'll use this, and in your application, this will generate treasure for you, OK? Is that too contrived? I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't. I came up with this at some point. but 
So here are the classes that we'll have in this SDK. We've got treasure, treasure chest, treasure chest factory, and I mean, those are all self-explanatory. Maybe a hinge that will affect what sound it makes when it opens, I don't know. But these are the classes that we'll have. And uh, it's pretty uh, self-evident what the flow will be. We wanna be able to get treasure from the treasure chest, okay? So I'm gonna use this example going through, so I hope you like it, or are indifferent to it. Just don't hate it. Um, <laughs> So we've identified our flows here. In the case of MongoDB Stitch, we're gonna log in, read and write data, and in libtreasure, we're going to get treasure from a treasure chest, okay? Next, we'll take a flat list of all the entities, okay? And this can be generated from your doc tool anyway, like Javadoc will, you saw that huge list that will just output a, a flat list of all, all of your entities, or you can search the directory for class files uh, or, or something like that, but you can get a, a big list of everything. And then just look through and try to, try to, yeah, that's it. Next, we're going to look through and group them all by each flow, okay? In the case of MongoDB Stitch, we uh, have classes like Stitch Auth, Stitch User. Those are going to fall under the login flow. Um, we have remote Mongo database and remote Mongo collection, and those are going to have to do with reading and writing data. Um, I'll, talk, I'll talk more about that in a sec. In the case of uh, libtreasure, all of these things have to do with the one flow because it's, a, it's a, an example, so, um, you know. So you do need to understand the entities well enough to know where they fit. Um, uh, you can use the class name as a good indicator. We had stitch auth there, so auth, authentication, logging in. Um, you can look as uh, modules will probably contain related classes, directories will probably contain related files, but not necessarily. Um, and of course you can ask the original developers for help with this, assuming they're still at your organization. Um, but they may not be, but somebody will help you. You can then order the entities by flow, and then flow order means the order that you would use them in the, to, to accomplish the task that, that is the basis of the flow there. So uh, in this case, we have the flow, the only flow, flow number one, alphabetically, hinge treasure, treasure chest. And in flow order, we have tre treasure chest factory. That's going to be the first thing that you're going to interact with because that's what will give you a, uh, a treasure chest. You have a hinge, maybe you pass that into the treasure chest factory, so that's gonna be the second thing that you uh, encounter. Treasure chests is what you get out of the factory, and then treasure is what you get out of the treasure chests. So that's in flow order, okay? And then we've done all the things that we need to do on paper. You can do that for the other flow as well, uh, for any other flows that you have. So now it's time to edit some code comments. Wow, that was energetic. That was like the maximum level of energy you'll get from me. Um, in code, thank you. I like that. So in the code comments, we're gonna add links, add content, add examples, and call out the gotchas. These are, it doesn't have to be in this order. This is just the order that I'm, I'm going with. First, adding links. We'll wanna link to the previous and next entities in the flow. The importance here, so here we have treasure chest. Let's say we're, we're documenting treasure chest. We're going to have previously treasure chest factory. You might want to look at that. Um, and up next, look at treasure. It's pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Link to the first one in the flow. And use see also links. I think there aren't really enough see also links in, in references. These can go to your topic pages to help integrate uh, in the overall documentation experience. It's really important to use links uh, in this because as you saw with the Javadoc, you do have a huge list of all of the um, uh, of links to the rest of the entities in the SDK, but there's no rhyme or reason to them. It's just all of the links. Uh, this having links and having a, an intentional set of links um, will inform the context. It'll shape the context around your entity. So even if you just end up on that page and there's no other information, just having links there to relevant things in the flow will help you, will help you define that context. It'll help you understand it as a user. Okay? Links show how things fit together. Linking together is what good docs do. So be sure to use links. If you do only one thing from this, just put links in your SDK reference manual, please. 
Um, nothing's worse than ending up on a page and not knowing where to go from there. So here we have an example, again, with the treasure thing. So I have this class. It's got a name and a value. Um, and it represents a treasure with a name and a value. See also, this is the oxygen syntax, but it'll vary for you. But see, treasure chest, treasure chest factory. We can improve this even more by having uh, this built into the actual text. You can loot treasure from a treasure chest. And in Doxygen's case, that treasure chest will turn into a link. And you, now you can see it quickly, and you can link to see how to get treasure. You're not just going to use this directly, OK? Um, so that's adding links. Now let's add content. So the guiding principle here is in the leading, in, leading line, you want to answer the question, what is this for? Here, now, OK, I'll go through this in a sec. But uses, uh, this is a treasure chest, and it has two, two pieces of functionality associated with it. We have open and loot treasure. Um, and here's the brief that some SDK developer has written, you, because, just to check off the box. Um, uses golden hinge to open the lid and some random thing, random generator, to select a treasure. And this, this, is no, this may seem a bit contrived. Maybe it's a bit exaggerated. But this is like a real world type of thing that you might encounter. Because this is what I was talking about when I said implementer oriented. The person who wrote this is thinking in terms of the implementation. And they're putting implementation details in the description to explain what this is. That's going to be relevant to them. It's meaningless to us. It's meaningless to the user. So let's improve that. There we go. A treasure chest can be opened, allowing you to loot the treasure within. And that describes what the treasure chest actually does. That says what we can do with it. Let's add examples. And in this case, again, it doesn't have to be realistic. You just want to demonstrate the syntax and provide something that people can copy and paste. Um, and you want to give enough of the context around the sample that somebody can use it right away, but you don't want to bury the entity that you're actually demonstrating. So in this case, we have an example for loot treasure in the treasure chest. And um, you can see I'm actually, this, the function is called on the last line there, uh, treasure chests, chest.loot treasure. But um, I'm providing enough context to show like, how I got the treasure chest to use, uh, and to use that. OK. Uh, so just a word about testing, because if you put code examples in your uh, co code comments, that becomes a bit of a main maintainability issue. Um, so if you can, you can write the code examples as integration tests and then copy them to your comments and treat the integration tests as the source of truth. Um, there's also some, some frameworks, some languages and frameworks, uh, such as Rust, have documentation testing as a built-in feature. So you can leverage that. But in other frameworks cases, um, just use unit testing or, or something like that. Because a malfunctioning code example might be worse than having no code example. Finally, we'll call out the gotchas. And a gotcha is uh, when an SDK violates the uh, principle of least astonishment. You have assumptions uh, that you make as a user. And if it's not called out explicitly that th those assumptions may be wrong, um, you're going to have a bad time. And you're, you could be very frustrated. Uh, so you'll want to think of what assumptions people will make while using your SDK, <clears throat> and then call out any of those. So in this uh, example here, we have the treasure chest again. Um, and this loot treasure function returns the treasure inside. What I forgot to tell you was that it's a destructive operation that empties the chest and returns the treasure inside. Okay, you may have to dig in the code to actually find these these types of these assumptions or these kind of. Well, actually, this, this isn't even an assumption. This is an important fact. Um, you can only loot the treasure once. That's kind of important to know. So call those out. And what happens if you don't open the chest first, or if it's already empty? It throws exceptions. A good SDK developer should already have documented these uh, exceptions. And maybe it wouldn't use exceptions in a real library, but this is an example. OK, so we've done those uh, four steps. And 
there, there it is again overall. So on paper, we've identified the flows. We took all the entities, grouped them by flow, and then ordered the entities on paper. And then, or not on paper, it could be like, use whatever. Um, and then in the actual code comments, we have added the links, added the content, added the examples, and called out all the gotchas. Here's another example. The remote Mongo collection is an interface. Um, and in this leading line, I've answered the question of what we can do with it, which is allowing uh, read and write on a database. Um, I have the links here called out to the previous, which is the remote Mongo database. That's how you get a collection. And then the next, which is what you can do. And I also have a gotcha down there, which is if you're already familiar with the drivers, you may want to know that in this library, this, uh, this version of that, of the collection works a bit differently. Okay? So there's, everything's marked up just so you can see. Might be a bit, anyway, whatever. But there's the uh, gotchas. Also, here's another, another one. You need to log in first. It's important to know, and that's the other flow. This is the read and write there. You need to log in, so, um, so it's okay to link to the other flow to get people started. Code example and more links, and those links, uh, it's hard, might be hard to see, but you can link out to topic pages again. Um, just be, uh, you know, you don't wanna have people bouncing back and forth too much, but y you can use your judgment and, and put a good number of topic pages links. So now let's talk a bit about commitment. That may seem like a non sequitur, but this is, we're going into code and we're actually editing uh, code, so we have to make commits. Um, and that can, pro that can be challenging for, uh, for you as a documentarian or as an external team member. So I'm gonna go over a few strategies that you can use to to collaborate with the teams better. So first thing you'll want to do, obviously, and you probably should have already, um, is to have management buy-in. Um, if you need some uh, tips for, or some arguments for how to convince them that you, you, this is something you should be doing, you can just say that great docs means happy users. And I hope everybody agrees with this here, in this room anyway, that all else being equal, great docs win. So that's one tip. Um, you can talk to the lead developer or the team overall and get their comfort level with you committing uh, code to their code base. And this uh, might be challenging at first, but you can, you'll can you find that they might be relieved that they you actually want to collaborate with them. I mean, developers can be pretty, uh, you know, they can be, what is it? What do I say? I don't know. <laughs> you know how they are. Meet face to face. Don't just be a slack head. Um, uh, put it in their calendar. If if they're if you're having trouble nailing them down, just put an event in their calendar, and they'll they'll come around to meet you. Um, you want to remind them that you're a, you're a person, you're a human, and you know you're here. So um, yeah, it's pretty important to to meet them face to face and discuss what you want to do ask them any questions, um, get any tips that you might need. Um, in terms of your own fear that you might break everything, um, just remember that code reviews, unit tests, and integration testing exist for a reason. So um, if you do break something, it happens. It's not a big deal. It can be fixed. Um, and you should only be editing code comments anyway, but sometimes things, things happen. Um, so yeah, don't worry about that too much, if you can. <clears throat> um, if things really aren't going well, you can do this. Just do it anyway. And then, because you have management buy-in, right? Just give it to them, and then no developer will let this keep going for, for that long. They're just gonna, yeah, anyway. But this isn't you doing all the work for them. This is a way to improve the overall SDK reference manual uh, in your organization. So this is a collaborative effort. You want to, uh, you want to 
work with the SDK team to help them improve their documentation as well. Okay, so regarding some technical skills that you may need and if you have not used Git before or, um, or haven't made a pull request before, uh, here are some links and check out this talk as well if you missed it yesterday. I was not editing these slides last night or anything. <laughs> But uh, these will be helpful talks and look into what, uh, maybe they use a different version control system. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, you'll, you'll want to get acquainted with those. If you are a developer on the SDK team, um, you should be making docs a standard just like unit tests. Um, every time you add code um, or every time you add an API, try to add docs with it. Um, and if you claim you don't have time, what's that principle where time, where work fills up the time? I, um, yeah, make time for it. Include it in estimates and in the definition of done. Just like unit tests. You wouldn't ship code without unit tests, so don't ship code without docs. And don't just put like the, the golden hinge example I had, like put some thought into it. Um, here's one strategy. You can become a champion um, in, code reviews for the docs issue. So go in, and you can do this if you're a documentarian as well. Just watch all of the PRs that come through and just pay attention to the one thing, which is whether the person who made the code has added docs. And if you're just one person doing this uh, can make a huge difference in my experience. Um, define flows as a team. This is uh, can, something you can do as a, as a team. Uh, just so everybody's on the same page, or provide it as a, as a list or, or somewhere in, your, in a Google Doc or something. You can, if this, again, this is one of those things where if it's not working or if, uh, if you can't find somebody to be the champion for this, uh, then just force them to do it by... <laughs> I mean, so basically every sprint or whatever um, whatever chunk of time, assign somebody to be the docs champion and they can go through the PRs and, and make sure that, uh, that docs are being done, okay? So just remember, what you wanna do is write for the user and that links shape the context and you just wanna go with the flow. So I wanna thank the sponsors uh, organizers, volunteers, and venue staff, all the other speakers, the live transcribers, or transcriber, and uh, MongoDB uh, for keeping me employed, and um, <laughs> my colleagues for encouraging me to do this talk, and you, the audience, as well. If you have questions or comments, or just want to shout at me on the internet, my Twitter here, StarchFacts, please follow me, and uh, send me an email. Thanks. <laughs>